Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking Diki. So we thought we'd go back to maybe something a little lighter after <laughs> the topics of the last couple of episodes, though. Um, yet it somehow doesn't turn out that way. Parts of it will be lighter. <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about one of our cocktail videos, one of the videos about the etymology of a cocktail, specifically the Mai Tai. So we'll get to that in a moment and play the voiceover from that and then discuss it and some topics that come up from it. But before we get to that, a little bit of feedback and housekeeping. And the first thing is to say thank you very much to a Patreon patron, Jason Howell. And to say sorry for the delay in acknowledging you. The last two episodes kind of threw things off a bit just because of the differences in our production schedule for them. So you started contributing a little while ago, and we really appreciate that support. So thank you. Thanks, Jason. Second... Speaking of the last couple of episodes, we really appreciate all the response we've had to those episodes. Um, people have said some very nice things about them, and they started some good conversations on Twitter in particular, and some other blog responses, and uh, just general what we hoped would happen, which was some more discussion. We definitely like to continue having those discussions and continue to follow up on these ongoing pressing issues. And surprisingly, very few trolls. I know. Basically none, I think. Hmm. Very odd. I think it's because we're just not important enough. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, we haven't really made it yet. We aren't mm. being yelled at on the internet. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> One note, there's now a transcription of episode 51. That's the first of the two parts. Up on the website, On it's online, and there's also a downloadable doc file if you want that. There will soon be one up for episode 52, part two, and as well one for episode 44, the one where we talked about Greek, Latin, and Anglo-Saxon words for race. So we just thought those transcriptions might be useful, especially if these are going to be used at all in teaching. So those will be available. And also on a related note, just so everyone knows, because I don't think we've been making it clear up till now, though I've started adding a line about it in the website. These podcast episodes, just like our videos, are available as a create under a Creative Commons attribution share alike license, which means that they are usable in whole or in part by anyone for any purpose, as long as you credit us and make the resulting thing, whatever thing it is we make, uh, also shared with a Creative Commons license. If for some reason that isn't possible for an education reason or something, get in touch with us. We can probably make arrangements, but that's the basic default license. We really do want people to feel like they can use excerpts or the whole of this uh, in whatever way is useful to them. Just wanted to make that clear. All right. I think that's all the housekeeping. Right. So. On to the cocktail. On to the cocktail. So they're Mai Tais, obviously. So the Mai Tai is the classic tiki drink from the tiki craze that we'll be hearing about in a moment. Mm -hmm. And there have been lots of different recipes for the Mai Tai over the years, including, as you'll hear in a moment, a disagreement about who actually invented the thing. Mm -hmm. We've ended up using, uh, coming up with a sort of middle version, which I guess isn't in the voiceover that we'll be playing mm. because it was the, uh, in the video, you can see Mark mixing one. And telling you the recipe, but I will put a link in our show notes to the specific proportions we used. Right. It's rum, lime juice, triple sec or, or orange curacao, orgeat, orgeat, orgya, orja, <laughs> O-R-G-E-A-T. Orgeat. <laughs> and uh, I think that's everything. Oh, I put some tiki bitters in this one too. Oh, wow. Okay. Fancy. <laughs> so shall we drink those? And of course, served in tiki mugs. Mm-hmm. Cheers. <laughs> Mm. They're very delicious drinks. Mm. Very sweet. Mm -hmm. So you have to be prepared for that. Makes me think of summer, though. Yeah. Seems utterly un inappropriate right now. <laughs> <laughs> As we sit here wrapped in multiple sweaters, mm. <laughs> having just turned off the space heaters. We make Mai Tais quite a lot. So, though we didn't actually make them really until we made that did the, did the research did that video, this, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they became a staple in our summer mm -hmm. drinking. 
So I don't have much to say about the Mai Tai. I really like it. <laughs> That's basically it. And it also has led to us learning a lot more about types of rum. Yes. Because that's quite important to what a Mai Tai tastes like. Yeah. You're supposed to use the best rums available, basically. Mm -hmm. And so often a mixture of rums. A mixture of different rums, yeah. yep. All right. Well, let's listen to what you have to say about the origin of the Mai Tai. And we'll reconvene in a few minutes to talk more tiki. When you hear tiki bar, you may think of Hawaiian shirts, tiki torches, grass skirts, and leis. And you wouldn't be wrong, but as always, there's more to the story. The word tiki itself comes from Maori with related forms in a number of other Polynesian languages. The Polynesian language family, a subset of the large Austronesian language family, is a group of some 40 related languages spoken in the scattered islands of the Central and South Pacific, including Maori, Tahitian, and Hawaiian. Owing to their relatively recent spread, the languages still show fairly strong resemblances with similar sounds and much related vocabulary. In Maori, tiki is the name of the first created man, or the creator of the first man. Polynesian mythology is complex and varied, with numerous different deities known by many different names, reflecting the wide diversity of cultures covered by the term Polynesian. In Maori culture in particular, tiki is often said to have been formed either by the war god Tu or the forest god Tane, out of red clay or a mixture of blood and clay. In some versions of the story, tiki seizes reflection in a pool, and being unable to touch this companion covers the pool with earth, which then produces a woman. The first sexual act follows, so tiki is often associated with procreation or fertility. The word tiki also refers to a large wooden carving of a human figure, which has religious significance or marks sacred locations. Thus, the word tiki and its Polynesian cognates generally mean image or figurine. Tiki culture in the U.S. had its origin in the 1930s. In 1933, Texas-born Ernest Gant opened a restaurant in Hollywood called Don's Beachcomber Cafe, the first tiki bar. Gant had traveled around the Pacific, then ended up in Southern California doing odd jobs in the film and restaurant industries, and even a little bootlegging during Prohibition. But things turned around for Gant after he opened his own restaurant, with South Pacific-inspired decor, Chinese-American cuisine, and rum-based cocktails, mostly because rum was one of the cheapest spirits at the time. Soon renamed as Don the Beachcomber, it became trendy drawing some of the Hollywood elite, and while Gant was deployed in World War II, his soon-to-be ex-wife Sunny Sund continued the success of the chain of restaurants and expanded into 16 locations. Oh, and after years of everyone assuming it was his name, Gant eventually legally changed his name to Don Beach. Don the Beachcomber also inspired competition. In 1934, Vic Bergeron, born in California to a French-Canadian father, opened a restaurant named Hinky Dinks in Oakland. But after visiting Don the Beachcomber's bar, he changed the decor and menu to a Polynesian-inspired style and renamed it Trader Vic's, inventing a whole new persona of a South Pacific traveler for himself. Bergeron's chain of restaurants also went on to be quite successful in the tiki craze of the 1950s, and still exists today. And it's possibly through Trader Vic's that the word tiki started being used for this mid-century pop culture trend. But to tell that story, I have to go all the way back to the 19th century and the World's Fair. The first World's Fair, London's Great Exhibition, organized by Prince Albert in 1851, kicked off the practice of these grand celebrations of industrial progress. Its featured attraction, the Crystal Palace, is the perfect reflection of Victorian notions of industrial progress and Britain's paramount world influence. Later, as the United States star was rising at the end of the 19th century, the 1893 fair marked American ascendancy and growing sense of American exceptionalism. This fair, held in Chicago, also celebrated the anniversary of Columbus's arrival in the New World and was dubbed the World's Columbian Exhibition, so its aspects of colonialism and imperialism are fairly obvious. The 1893 fair featured native villages, recreations of the living conditions of so-called primitive peoples from around the world, including actual inhabitants, part of a widespread and truly awful 19th century fashion for human zoos. As a sort of sideline to the Chicago fair, newspaperman M. H. DeYoung organized the 1894 California Midwinter International Exposition in Golden Gate Park with its own exotic displays, and among the exhibits were some Maori tiki carvings. After the fair was over, they didn't go back to New Zealand, but continued to be held in the Palace of Fine Arts building, which became the M. H. de Young Memorial Museum, where they still are today. At some point, years later, Trader Vic's restaurant started using the image of one of these carvings on the restaurant's menu, which helped establish the style, look, and name of the tiki bar craze. Vic and Beach were friendly rivals throughout the tiki craze, but one ongoing argument between them was who invented the quintessential tiki drink, the Mai Tai. The Mai Tai started out as a cocktail that features its main ingredient, rum, and also typically contains curacao, orgeat syrup made from almonds, and lime. 
Don the Beachcomber invented a drink he called a Mai Tai Swizzle in 1933, but that recipe is actually quite different from Trader Vic's Mai Tai recipe invented in 1944. The word Mai Tai, which means good, is from Tahitian and has related forms in a variety of Polynesian languages. The story that Trader Vic told is that some Tahitian friends were visiting his restaurant and he mixed up the drink for them. After sipping it, one of them immediately called out Mai Tai Roa Ai, which Vic translated as out of this world the best, and so that's what he named the drink. Although the Mai Tai has a Tahitian name, none of the ingredients are in any way Polynesian. Rum comes from the Caribbean and is made from the byproducts of the sugarcane refining process. The name is something of a linguistic mystery, perhaps from an English slang word meaning good, excellent, high quality, or odd, which itself may come from a Romany word, or it might come from the Malay word for a rice spirit, or from a Dutch word for a type of large cup, or it might be from the last syllable of the Latin word for sugar, saccharum. Orja, a European product, comes through French from the Latin word hordeum, meaning barley, which it used to contain, ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root that meant to bristle and Curaçao is named after the Caribbean island it hails from, which name itself comes from the Portuguese word either for heart or cure, or from a now lost indigenous word. So the drink really is emblematic of tiki culture, being a blend of many cultures topped by a decorative element taken from the South Pacific, in this case the name. Though the Mai Tai can be considered the signature tiki drink, perhaps the second most famous is the Zombie, a very potent and complex concoction of several different rums, syrups, juices and bitters, created by Don the Beachcomber, according to legend, to cure the hangover of one of his customers. But it was so strong it left him feeling like the dead. It was always sold with a two drink limit, perhaps more for clever marketing purposes, though supposedly this was the last drink Howard Hughes had at Don's bar the night he hit a pedestrian on his drive home. Though the name does have a tropical flair, it certainly isn't connected with the South Pacific, coming instead from Haitian folklore originally referring to a snake god and later to a reanimated corpse, and ultimately derived from a West African word meaning god or fetish. However, the zombie cocktail does have an important role in the history of the tiki craze. Monty Prozer, a nightclub owner with mob connections also known for the Copacabana, yes that Copacabana, and a press agent who counted Walt Disney among his clients, opened the Hurricane Bar at the 1939 New York World's Fair and sold zombie cocktails, claiming them as his own invention. They became a smash hit, increasing the popularity of the tiki phenomenon. And what's more, as with the 1893 World's Fair, there was a concurrent West Coast Fair in 1939, the Golden Gate International Exposition, which was specifically themed to celebrate the cultures of the Pacific, and featured a 25 meter tall statue called Pacifica, a symbolic goddess of the Pacific. Over the first half of the 20th century we can see the world's fairs gradually moving from industrial triumphalism to cultural fetishization and appropriation to genuine attempts at intercultural communication, and this Golden Gate Fair did much to introduce the growing tiki culture as well as actual Polynesian culture more broadly to mainstream American society. Out of its start in the restaurant industry, tiki culture spread to other areas of 40s and 50s America. The tiki torches that were originally used to decorate the tiki bars and the tiki mugs in which tropical tiki drinks were served have become iconic. And the Hawaiian or Aloha shirt, which has its origins in 1930s Hawaii, became very popular in the US after servicemen posted in the Pacific and Asia during World War II brought them home. In fact, these returning Americans had a lot to do with the explosion of tiki culture in the 1940s and 50s, as did the incorporation of Hawaii as the 50th state in 1959. But the craze was also a reaction against the modernization and the industrialization of the post-war era, with a fantasy of an idealized primitive simplicity, a tropical paradise without the rigid rules of 50s morality and society. In some ways the Maori story of tiki makes a good metaphor here. Americans looked towards the fantasy of the South Pacific life, but being unable to reach it, instead made a copy of it for themselves, reflecting their own culture more than the Polynesian reality. The Polynesian aesthetic made its way into music as well, in the form of Exotica, a subset of the popular lounge music of the 1950s. Classically trained composer Les Baxter kicked off the genre with his 1952 album Le Sacre du Sauvage, obviously inspired by Stravinsky's Le Sacre du Printemps, which combined jazz forms and tribal rhythms in orchestral arrangements that were meant to evoke the exotic Polynesian world. A few years later Martin Denny had a hit with a cover of one of Baxter's songs, and popularized the vibraphone heavy sounds of the new genre which took its name from his 1957 album Exotica. He even performed for a while at Don the Beachcomber's Hawaii Tiki Bar. Also worth mentioning is the Japanese American composer Tak Shindo, who after his time in an internment camp during World War II explored the fusion of Japanese and Western musical traditions, including some Asian influenced Exotica music. 
the original Tiki craze was actually quite short-lived, with its mainstream popularity lasting only from the late 40s to the early 60s, when the countercultural movements of the hippies and the growing awareness of the problems of American imperialism, colonial history, and cultural appropriation combined to make Tiki culture seem tacky, artificial, and even racist. But there have been several waves of Tiki revivals. For instance, in the 90s Tiki culture became popular for its kitsch value as a fun retro fashion. And more recently, there's been a movement among the craft cocktail set towards rediscovery and reverse engineering the original tiki drinks, and new versions that reflect more modern tastes, with new tiki bars opening. One interesting instance of this recent revival is Tiki Bar TV, which was one of the very first vodcast web series launching in 2005, made by Canadians about an American cultural trend based on elements of South Pacific and Caribbean societies, it was a highly ironic and self-referential satire on both internet culture and the tiki phenomenon, and reflects a more postmodern, post-colonial engagement with pop culture. Though tiki culture was never really a reflection of cultural diversity, perhaps its re-examination can be. So the obvious elephant in the room when taking on this topic, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I think I did the only thing I could do and take it head on, is the cultural appropriation mm -hmm. and the deeply problematic nature of that. Mm -hmm. And the basic sort of racist perception of the other that's yeah. at the heart of, of tiki culture. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing to keep in mind is that tiki culture is really about mid-century U.S. culture. Right. That when we look at it, that's what we're looking at. Really. That's what we're really looking at. And it just has this, you know, kind of veneer of a fantasy escape world of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, this sort of simplistic, primitive lifestyle. Well, it's the chop yeah, a tropical fantasy. The tropical fantasy. fantasy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the other thing I wanted to kind of bring into this is the sort of the flip side of that, the, the idea of intercultural communication. Mm -hmm. which has increasingly become the the aim of things like World's Fairs right. when we look in more modern times. Right. And indeed, as I kind of point out in the video, the whole tiki culture is itself sort of tied up with the history of the World's Fairs. So at mm -hmm. various points, they intersect in quite interesting ways. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, one of the things that I, I find quite interesting is a, a number of the cocktail videos that I've made, mm -hmm. specifically the the first pair of videos about the word cocktail itself, mm -hmm. um, and after that the Gimlet yeah. video, both of which we've now done podcasts on, mm -hmm. also deal with ideas about colonialism mm -hmm. and international relations. And mingling, if not of cultures exactly, of cultural production, mm -hmm. like the kinds of products that come out of different cultures. Yeah. Every single kind of cocktail we've talked about would only be possible because of international trade. Yeah. You know, quite apart mm -hmm. from empire, which is another important element of mm -hmm. both of those as well. But just from the very basic thing, like you talk about with the Mai Tai, that the ingredients come from all over the world. Yeah. They're mixed drinks. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's... Uh... Yeah. But I mean, you, <laughs> one can have a mixed, mixed drink, drink yes. that doesn't. But, but it seems that the most iconic ones anyway... Tend to be this kind of, yeah. Need, need multiple uh, points of origin. Mm-hmm. So uh, first I want to talk a little bit, therefore, about the original idea of tiki, mm -hmm. specifically the mythological background. Right. And I mentioned that story about tiki seeing in the pool of water, mm -hmm. the image. And so this is a, a motif that can be found in a lot of mythologies, in mm -hmm. fact. This is a sort of common motif. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention specifically the Greek, since we're, we're going to be talking about Greek uh, mm -hmm. culture later on, the myth of Narcissus. A boy looking in a pool and seeing something beautiful that he can't have. Mm -hmm. It's directly Narcissus, yeah. 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 The other thing about Tiki is that he was a, a giver of customs and laws. Right. In addition to that, you know, kind of creation, part right. of the creation story. So in that sense, he's also a culture hero. Right. Which in many, though not all mythologies, those two do go together. The creator or first man or whatever, mm -hmm. and the culture hero. Greece is a bit weird in that it doesn't always put those two things together, though the Prometheus myth sometimes puts them together. Yeah, right. yeah. But, uh, Narcissus is not a culture hero. No, however, no. <laughs> Greek myth. Nor a creator god. No. <laughs> the only thing he creates, and it's only accidentally, is a flower. Hmm. Related to the, the tiki mythology is something called hay tiki, which are kind of pendants carved out of greenstone mm -hmm. that the Maori wore. 
Right. And I say maybe connected because we it's actually unknown exactly what the original signification of them. Hmm. But it could be a connection to the tiki myth or it could be an element of ancestor worship hmm. or it could be a fertility symbol representing the goddess of childbirth. And I'll attempt this this name. Hine Te Waiwa. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Almost certainly you did not. <laughs> yes, almost certainly I did. Or it could represent a human fetus and therefore hmm. also be connected with fertility. fertility right. By the way, these Hey Tiki mm -hmm. were mentioned in a novel you might have read by, by Niall Marsh. Marsh. Yeah. Yes, actually, I do. Remember Vintage that. Murder. It's yeah. Called. Yeah. I haven't read the book, so I don't know what. Uh... I can't immediately remember which one it is because she has, a, she's being a New Zealand writer. Right. Um, she has a number of books set in New Zealand or with New Zealand people involved. Right. And she has several Maori characters and mm -hmm. plots and I can't remember. But anyway, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think she refers to them simply as tiki. Yeah. But we'll maybe include a picture in the show notes of uh, one of these pendants. Okay. Also comparable to the the tiki as as figurine or human mm -hmm. image, people often make a comparison to the Easter Island heads. Right, right. Well, they're actually called Moai, and they were created by the Rapa Nui culture, also a Polynesian culture and a related right. Polynesian yeah. language. So they may, in fact, be some some distant relation right. to them. They may, it, it's speculated, they, they may also be uh, a form of ancestor worship. So right. that that is a possible connection there. I suppose I suppose it may, makes uh, it somewat appropriate, therefore, that Ralph Stackpole, the the uh, the artist who uh, designed that Pacifica statue, oh yeah, decided to do a statue as a representation of, of Pacific, Pacific culture. Yeah, but of course, tiki mugs, which also mm -hmm. come out of that image, are the sort of U.S. commercialization of mm -hmm. what was originally a religious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a, a, a vulgarization of yeah. a sacred image. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that is straight ahead appropriation. Yeah. Right? That's using something that is important to one culture in a way that completely trivializes it for yes, another culture. Exactly. Yeah. Now, of course, the, the whole tiki craze uh, of the 20th century is mm -hmm. not, in fact, the first time that Western cultures have been influenced and inspired by Polynesian culture. Mm -hmm. So in the 19th century, Herman Melville wrote a novel, Taipei, A Peep at Polynesian Life. A peep. Polynesian. Okay. <laughs> and perhaps even more importantly um, are the famous paintings by Paul Gauguin. Oh, yeah, yeah. He took a trip to Tahiti and painted, yeah, no, he did, painted did, those paintings based yeah. on, on what he saw. Yeah. And again, both of these are sort of representations of, you know, a 19th century idea of paradise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the Edenic element, right, yeah. of this is... This is that the Polynesian peoples are humanity before the fall. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that they live in this pre-sin world before the knowledge of good and evil, which makes it sound maybe like it's um, laudatory, like it's praising them. But of course, what it's also doing is saying it's before the knowledge of good and evil. So they're simplistic and naive and right. fully human. So, you know, that's the flip side of that seeming... Often people say, oh, but it's because we love the culture so much or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yes, but because you are turning it into some thing that it isn't mm -hmm. and something that you mark as not fully human or fully civilized. Yeah. So when I was looking into these words that come mm -hmm. from Polynesian roots, uh, in particular, I made use of a website called the Polynesian Lexicon Project Online, mm -hmm. which basically draws from dictionaries of various Polynesian languages. Right. And then we'll display them on one page. So you by... can kind of see the connections. Yeah. 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 So and we'll, it, it, they're listed by the proto form, the reconstructed proto form. Oh. So okay. proto Polynesian. And then it gives all the cognate words. Like your words. proto Indian European dictionary, yeah. basically, yeah. but an online version. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. So it's quite a lot of fun to play around with. Put a, put a link to it in yeah. the show notes. But just to give a bit more detail about what's going on with some of those words linguistically, mm -hmm. one of the things that I found just from looking at that without you know necessarily doing a lot of research mm -hmm. into Polynesian phonology yeah. is the sound correspondences. So the K sound becomes a glottal stop mm -hmm. in Hawaiian and Tahitian. Okay. And the T sound becomes a K sound in Hawaiian. 
Right. So this is similar, obviously different sounds, but similar to Grimm's Law or something. Mm -hmm. where Predictable one, sound changes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So the Maori word tiki mm -hmm. becomes the Hawaiian word ki'i. So that right. T becomes a K and the it K becomes, becomes a glottal, a glottal stop. stop. And in Tahitian, that word is ti'i with a glottal stop. There. Right. Mai Tai, which comes from Tahitian Mai Tai, basically, or it should be really pronounced Mai Tai right. with a glottal stop, corresponds to Hawaiian Mai Kai. Okay. And Maori Mai Tai. So I just thought it was a little interesting. Yeah, because we, d we you talk so much normally about mm -hmm. Proto Indo European and mm -hmm. very rare, you know, occasionally a Semitic root or something, but. You, we don't tend, you know, English draws so much from European languages yeah, in general. Yeah. So you don't often have a chance to explore other language groups. So if there are any Polynesian phonologists listening in. Or speakers. Or speakers. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can let us know about some of these interesting mm -hmm. sound changes. And all of the mispronunciations we've been doing, because I'm fairly certain we're also mispronouncing Maori. Yeah, it's Maori, I think, yeah, or, or something closer to Maori. Yeah, I think it's got a number of sounds we're not making mm. is really the point here. <laughs> so I apologize for that. I know that we're we're mangling it. So getting back to the tiki craze itself in, yeah. in the United States, a lot of its success came from the sort of showmanship and flamboyance mm -hmm. of Don and Vic. Yeah, they were characters and they made stories. Mm -hmm. it, was yeah. a, it was a story to go out there. So... Whereas Don kind of got his inspiration from actual travels he did, mm -hmm. um, he obviously played that up more maybe than more than yeah. was real. But Vic was totally he totally made up his his persona. Yeah, he had lost a leg in, in a childhood illness, but he would pretend was... that he lost it uh, in a shark attack. <laughs> shark attack. <laughs> when really it was just a sharknado. He never left land. <laughs> And one trick that Don used to do was he would spray water onto the roof of the restaurant, pretending it was a tropical rainstorm. Right. For and the ambiance. For the ambiance. And also perhaps to keep uh, people from leaving too soon and, you know, staying for another round right. before. Uh... I mean, it really does, you know, sometimes the symbolism or the parallels are too obvious and to, you know, the fact that the Tiki craze was built on entirely made up travel narratives. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that you know the polynesian aspects of it were about an entirely made up version of what polynesia is like mm -hmm. like polynesian islands are like you know it's just straight ahead and yep. obvious yep. <laughs> really you no know, it's very much mm -hmm. this fantasy this mm -hmm. creation of a fantasy world so i mean tiki culture is really all about uh, appearance and fantasy mm -hmm. and i suppose in a sense then we can kind of make a comparison back to the original idea of tiki in that story of the pool of water yeah. you know it's a reflection say, of reality as you said in the video yeah mm -hmm. yeah and creating something that takes uh, a life of its takes on a life of its to own make it something else yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i guess the sort of takeaway that we can maybe make from this is that if we want to sort of put a more positive spin on it is that U.S. culture is all about fusion, in yeah, a sense. Yeah. So much of, of American culture comes from fusing together different cultural elements. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the question is, to what degree is that positive? You know, it really, is it, a po is it fusion and melting pot and is that mm -hmm. positive? Is it assimilation and appropriation and making cultures invisible? Mm-hmm. And I guess it's both of those things. I guess it's things. both of those things. And in different points, mm -hmm. you know, the, the power imbalances of between different cultures is what makes it a problem, mm -hmm. I guess. That if you just had a multiple cultures all meeting on equal footing, yeah. you could talk about them as fusing. Fusion suggests uh, an equality to some right. degree. And I think the history of American culture is about dominant cultures interacting with non-dominant cultures. And the Polynesian culture is very clearly a non-dominant culture. And then the relationship between those, every one is slightly different. Mm -hmm. To what degree it's a problem or not a problem. You know, with the Tiki culture, how many people of Polynesian descent were affected by it? I don't know. Like, I mean, Hawaii was affected by it mm -hmm. <laughs> quite profoundly. So yeah. I'm not to want to write that out. <laughs> you know, obviously, um, that that's not why Hawaii was made into a state, was forced to become a state, was not so that they could have tiki drinks. Like, right. it, it's not a one-to-one -one 
relationship there. But, but you know, obviously the story of Hawaii is not one of fusion. Mm-hmm. It's one of imperialism. Yeah. But, you know, whether South Sea Islands were harmed by the creation of the Mai Tai is a little hard to unpick. Yeah. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, did that do anything other than drive tourism? I don't know. And, and that would be a question I pro- probably would need to ask somebody from those cultures yeah. to say, like, how do you feel about the way that those cultural elements were taken yeah. and, and used. But yes, I mean, it is absolutely the story of America, for, for better or for, for worse. For better or for worse it's, is the point, yeah. It's very definitely a microcosm of mm-hmm. the many sort of cultural interactions mm-hmm. that uh, the U.S. has had. And not only the U.S. I mean, true. <laughs> it's not that Canada doesn't do this, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you know, but for it's instance, just so notable in it, the U.S. It is yeah. so noticeable. And, and the big contributions that the U.S. has made to world culture, things like jazz music, mm-hmm. we would not have. Or rock and roll or, yeah. If, if other than the fact that the, it has a history of slavery, mm-hmm. you know, that in no way obviously justifies slavery. <laughs> but it shows that something of value can come out sometimes of really of, of horror, horror yeah, horrible yeah, things. Yeah. That some people are able to, to take that mm-hmm. and make it into something else. Now, in the case of jazz and blues and mm-hmm. so forth, the people who were affected by it had an active hand in creating those new cultural elements. Yeah, yeah. That's not the same with, with tiki culture, obviously, because you know they were borrowing from distant cultures who had no involvement yeah. in it whatsoever. Other than in Hawaii. But Other that's, than in Hawaii. But that, that's yeah. the funny thing about tiki culture, though. We think of it as Hawaiian, mm-hmm. and I'm sure it is now but you know it's not like the first tiki bars were in hawaii or no, anything like no, that's that the right? thing. they were in california <laughs> yeah. it, it must have ended up in hawaii in, yeah. after, after being the in the u.s yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah because people associated hawaii with this mm-hmm. made-up world so to go a little further in the the kind of later history the kind of i suppose you could say almost the death of the tiki craze <laughs> i mentioned that story about monty proser the thief of the zombie cocktail right who was a, a disney press agent. Later on, Disney would itself reappropriate the tiki craze when they started the Enchanted Tiki Room in 1963 in Disneyland. Oh, okay. So it's a sort of Disneyfication <laughs> of an already Essentially kind of Disneyfied, di- Disneyfied <laughs> yeah. false fantasy world. Mm-hmm. Without quite as much drunkenness, presumably. Presumably. That's the, di- that's yeah. the Disneyfication. It's that's the Disneyfication. Lowering the alcohol content yeah. a bit. <laughs> Now, the Aloha shirt's another element of uh, mm-hmm. the... And one very dear to your heart. <laughs> yes. Because, <laughs> you know, when we have to make clear here that we're not speaking about these awful atrocities of cultural appropriation from a lofty position of moral superiority no. here. We're drinking from tiki mugs, though, today anyway, because I mix the drinks. <laughs> it's the ones that are like shaped like bamboo rather than the ones shaped like heads. <laughs> you did buy me the ones. I did ones buy you those, like though, so I can't, I can't say I didn't. And uh, you, in the summer, only wear Aloha shirts, essentially. True. And you, you play a lot of ukulele. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. So p- please proceed. <laughs> yes. Well, this is perhaps a, maybe a, a clearer example of fusion mm. in that they were originally made from kimono fabric, Okay. In Hawaii, specifically in Honolulu, by a Japanese immigrant to Hawaii, Koichiro uh, Miyamoto. Mm-hmm. So it has this this Asian actual Asian element actual from Asian an actual element, from Asian actual person. person. Yeah, <laughs> right. It yeah, was, that is quite different. In a way that is quite tiki, different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and the, these shirts were then taken up in the 1930s by a Chinese merchant in Hawaii, specifically in Waikiki, okay. uh, named Ellery Chun. Okay. So it's been kind of transformed again and again mm-hmm. through different contexts. And then they became, I guess they were brought back by servicemen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So they became, first first of all, popular in Hawaii specifically. Itself, and they only right. came to the United States after those uh, servicemen returned with them. Right, right. Another example of something coming out of kind of the fusion of cultural elements mm-hmm. uh, is, of course, the exotica music that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. And what I didn't mention, and perhaps I, I should have drawn more attention to, is that the key element of the exotica sound is the really heavy vibraphones. Yeah, you mentioned them, but yeah. you don't kind of go into it or Well, specifically, what a is. The, the vibraphone player in that first exotica album by Martin Denny mm-hmm. that really made it popular, he, he was named Arthur Lyman. He was actually born in Hawaii Mm -hmm. uh, of Hawaiian, French, Belgian, and Chinese descent. That's fairly (laughs) fusion-y. Yeah. (laughs) 
I mean, again, also imperialism, but yep. yeah, okay. <laughs> and of course, as I mentioned in the video, uh, um, Tak Shindo, a Japanese American who was, after he got out of the internment camp, decided to fuse the sounds of Japanese music mm -hmm. with this American, pop, this American popular yeah. music. Yeah. yeah. Now, one other little connection with the expositions, the World Fairs, in the 1894 California Midwinter International Exposition, which I believe I mentioned, mentioned in, in yeah. the video, one other thing that was included in that exposition was a Japanese tea garden. Ah, uh, yes. And that tea garden is still there. Mm -hmm. Funny thing is, it is through that that the fortune cookie is introduced to the U.S. Yes, which doesn't make any sense at doesn't all. Doesn't <laughs> make any sense because fortune cookies came from 19th century Japan. Right. Even though we think of them as, as Chinese. Chinese American food, part of Chinese American food tradition. Mm -hmm. So they did come out of Japan. They were introduced through that tea garden. And then somehow they ended they up in Chinese up. restaurants. Yeah. That could probably be its own, his, its own video, <laughs> just the sound <laughs> of that. But, all right. Now, the last thing I guess I want to bring up is something that was not a thing at the time that I originally made this video. <laughs> no. But... It is, uh, it is astonishingly a thing again, specifically tonight as we are recording. Mm. I'm sure it will have passed again by the time this comes out because the news cycle today mm -hmm. is about seven seconds long. But anyway. But I mentioned tiki torches mm -hmm. in the video and yeah. don't make any further comment about because it. Because there was nothing else to say, nothing to say time. about them. Yeah. But of course, now they've become kind of associated, associated with, let's say. But, you know, with the alt-right and their use of them at the Charlottesville March. March. Horror show. Yeah. And it is, there is a certain irony to the fact, and of course they were, you know, completely unaware of what they really meant and where they came from. They just wanted torches, torches. because, you know, that's what Nazis march with. Yeah. Yes. As I understand the history of the tiki torch, it is actually a product of the tiki craze. So it's mm -hmm. not any kind of traditional thing. Right. It's um, just something that was... Was created for these kinds of uh, Polynesian inspired restaurants. Right. And then they became then just popular in American culture for sort of backyard they're barbecues. They're just ornaments. Yeah, they're just, I mean, that's why... Even disconnected that's from the whole why they were thing. able to buy them for yeah. that rally thing, mm -hmm. because you they're go to any garden, in, garden store, store and they've got yeah. a whole bunch of them because people use them to light their backyards to yeah. make them look cool. Yeah. And the reason they're in the news tonight, and I will just say this because, as I said, it will almost certainly be gone again <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> is that today, um, February 7th, Yes. The news this afternoon was all about Trump wanting a military parade. God knows, maybe by next week it'll already have happened. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and people saying he wants a big military parade. How many tiki torches does he need for it? Yeah. And hasn't he already had his parade? And pictures of the tiki torches. And yeah, so it's being called out again. Right. <laughs> Just as we were prepping for this podcast, I <laughs> saw a whole bunch of tweets go by. So yeah, it's a thing now. The Tiki Torch is now associated indelibly, at least yeah. for... Well, indelibly. I don't know if anything's indelible anymore for that exact reason I just no. said, but it's now got an association it never had before. No. Mm. And yeah, the idea that it's associated with something that comes from cultural fusion. Yeah. So in the final analysis, I, I'm I'm really still not quite sure about what to do with this whole tiki culture thing. Mm -hmm. It makes me uncomfortable, mm -hmm. for sure, because there are absolutely racist Mm -hmm. elements in its history mm -hmm. and and not only in its history like every time it's revived there are elements of the revival that pick up on those things yeah. again yeah. you know that pick up on representations of tribalism and mm -hmm. savagery and things like that that are you know wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> but a mai tai is tasty what gets thrown out what doesn't get thrown out what can you do in a way that's respectful but still enjoyable mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I I, don't know either. I'm not quite sure where to fall on it. So we'd be interested in hearing any comments that you have. You know, mm. should this just be burned with fire? And... <laughs> Tiki torch fire? Yeah. Can one enjoy it ironically without participating in the problems of it? Mm -hmm. Probably not when I put it that way. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. What do you think about it? And I have no idea if there's any chance that we're listened to by anyone in any of the <laughs> Polynesian islands. But if you are listening from anywhere in that part of the world and want to weigh in, we'd very much appreciate hearing from you. Indeed. So all of this, we were thinking about how this connects to other things that we often like to talk about. And your Narcissus connection mm -hmm. made us both think of, there's one sort of, Parallel isn't quite the right word because it's not really parallel, but 
something that has some similarities and some parallels, I suppose, that is more in my realm of expertise, except it's really, at, as I was saying earlier tonight, at the edges of my expertise. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not really something I'm expert on. But well, it's okay. Most of this was at the edge of my area of expertise, too. <laughs> yeah, or beyond it. Yeah. Or beyond it, yeah. But obviously, the American use of this exotic culture mm -hmm. is hardly the first time a culture has ever looked to another culture yeah. for exotic fantasy, mm -hmm. right? And there's many, many examples of that. And we could go through a whole history of it. And we could talk about Orientalism specifically, which is really the underlying theoretical framework for yeah. much of this. And Europe, of course, has a long history of mm -hmm. Oriel Orientalism um, stretching from, you know, the Middle Ages and their exotic travel mm -hmm. literature mm -hmm. um, to, you know, the, the Romantic poets mm -hmm. um, idealizing Greece and east in eastern cultures and yeah well byron dressing up byron. as, east, as yeah. a greek mm -hmm. yeah and what counted as east and what counted as oriental and mm -hmm. and then the so there's a huge history of it and it's a deeply problematic history to yeah. say the least but what i wanted to look at was something that is closer to my area which is the roman interaction with greece because in some ways you say it stretch, you know, Orientalism stretches back to the Middle Ages, but it certainly stretches further back, back in yeah. various ways. One could look to Greece and Persia for Orientalism, and there are certainly elements of that. But I don't know that relationship and exactly how it works, as well as I know the Greek and Roman relationship. So I'm going to concentrate on that sure. because I have more to say about that. So for Rome, which to draw our parallels and to push the parallel a little further probably than it should go, let's say Rome is America. Mm -hmm. um, people are very fond of making that <laughs> parallel these days. But I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to say that instead of America being like Rome, Rome is sort of like America, right? right. It's got an empire. And as Rome expands into and around Greece and around the Mediterranean and in, interacts with Greece increasingly. Now, there was never a time that the Roman world was not interacting with the Greek world. As soon as there was Rome, there was interactions with Greek influences. So I'm not, I don't want to say that the simplistic narrative that may, that people used to say, which has definitely been exploded as, you know, Rome was Rome until it expanded and suddenly went to Syri Syracuse and Sicily and suddenly it was influenced by Greece that it had never been influenced by before. Right. That's not true. But the more it expanded, the more it dealt with Greece, the more these influences mattered. So I there's a very long and complicated story of those interactions. We're not going to get into all of that. But one thing that Greece was for Rome was an exotic other, right? right. So in that way, it's a parallel. You've got this imperial power and a place that comes under its control. And there's many things Greece was to Rome, not all of which Polynesia and the Polynesian islands were to America by any means. Like uh, the Romans thought of Greece as you know, highly sophisticated, for instance. They did not see them as a primitive culture, much the opposite. So it's not a perfect parallel by any means. But one element that really was, I think, importantly parallel is the connection of the Greek world with pleasure. Right. So... You know, you talked about how the sort of fantasy of the tiki world was this fantasy of a of a, a world you could go to that wasn't like 1950s America, that didn't mm -hmm. have these strict moral codes where, you know, women hardly wore anything and everybody wasn't any monogamy. And, you know, like you could go and do things you couldn't do at home. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that's what Greece was for Rome, or it was one of the things that Greece could be for Rome. And there's also the element of Rome conquered Greece, but at the same time, the influx of that culture was coming into the, the conquering culture. Very famously, Horace says this, it's expressed multiple times by Romans, but Horace says it in the most sort of quoted way, captive Greece took her rough victor captive, hmm. is the Graecia capta ferrum capit victorem. The idea being, when Rome conquered Greece, Greece culturally conquered Rome. Right. He's speaking in, that's an epistle to one, and he's specifically speaking about poetry. Right. Uh, and I think you can make the parallel of the music of Exotica to, mm. to Greek poetry in Rome, at least to some extent, because, I mean, that is what poetry was. It was an equivalent to popular music. Mm -hmm. And it is certainly true that, you know, the Romans 
were all over Greek meters and Greek style of poetry and, and, and took that very much into the heart of their literature. So there's that. But I was reading an article by uh, Andrew Wallace Hadrill. I will link in the notes. Uh, to be Roman, go Greek is hmm. the title of it. And he, it's a longer, m more complex argument. But one of the things he talks about is he talks about sort of the idea of code switching. The Roman elite from a very early period knew Greek or learned Greek, learned Greek literature. But there was always this sort of tension between when they would speak Greek and when they wouldn't. Hmm. There's stories of them going to Greece and forcing the Greeks to speak through interpreters <laughs> so as to stop them from overwhelming them with their linguistic facilities <laughs> <laughs> because the Greeks are too good at speaking, <laughs> even though the Romans who were forcing them to speak through interpreters could speak Greek. <laughs> They refuse to speak it. And th but then there's other stories of Romans going to Greece and speaking in Greek to the great acclaim of the Greeks who were just so wowed by their ability to speak Greek. So, it, you know, there's contextually very different situations. Mm. But what we see at Rome is a sort of an adoption of a lot of Greek dress. So the, the, the sort of key symbolic elements are Greek clothing, Greek language and Greek art. Right. Okay, so those are your, and you know, there's a lot of parallels there to the tiki culture, ornamentation, decoration, um, music, mm -hmm. and clothing. So I'll, I'll quote a little bit from what Wallace Hadrill says here. The social power of the exotic is what the Greek world offered. Right. The Roman aristocracy appropriated the glamour and exotic appeal of Hellenistic luxuries because it enhanced their own standing among their peers. The impulse is highly competitive, driving to restless pursuit of novelty as imports become tame with familiarity. And I mean, it's not totally parallel to the tiki craze, but, you know, this idea that you want to keep up with the neighbors mm -hmm. and, you know, the 50s suburban world of everybody has to have whatever the new craze is. And the idea of the exotic so Greece was an exotic for the Romans of the mid to late Republic and early empire. So they wanted to have it because it was a luxury, high status item and one that symbolized pleasure. So I think there is a, a definite element of overlap there. Uh, the idea that the Greek, there was sort of Latin was authoritative, but Greek had the seductive pleasure of literature. <laughs> that's another phrase that's used um, by Valerius Maximus who says the authority of Latin, that the Romans didn't want the authority of Latin to be overwhelmed by the seductive power of literature. But at the same time, you know, for the Romans to get to the point where they could speak Greek as well as Latin was a, a type of imperial power, mm -hmm. right? So it was sort of both. And what ended up happening for a lot of the upper classes was that Greek statuary, art, dress became a way of marking the private versus the public and the pleasurable versus the stoic proper Roman. You would go Greek mm. in order to enjoy yourself as a relaxing of the strictures of Roman morality and Roman life. You know, and some of that was sort of practical in the sense that the southern Italy was a very Greek area of Italy, and that's where they had their pleasure villas. And so you'd go down to the, the Bay of Naples and relax and wear Greek clothing hmm. and instead of the toga. Right. It gave an excuse for pleasure. To, right. to do something in a Greek fashion was an escape from the Roman rules. And so, like, you'd put Greek statuary in your garden, in your household, and you'd have dinner out in the garden when you were being relaxed. But you'd have it in the triclinium with its Roman couches and everything when you were being formal and Roman in togas. Right. And so I think that that, again, like the tiki bar, you mm -hmm. know, does show and that's the kind of fantasy. Because the thing is, Greeks in Greece were no more, you know, given over to exotic pleasure than Romans were in Rome, really. Mm -hmm. This is this is about the stereotype of what Greekness is right. to Romans mm -hmm. rather than what Greeks really are. I mean, Greeks had ideals of self-control and highly codified behavioral customs for men and women and were not in any way lax, whatever that means. You know, they had their own rigid rules, mm -hmm. too. They were just different rules, but also more to the point for the Romans to do Greek things was to relax their rules, but not to take on the Greek rules. Right. Polynesian culture, I'm sure, has deep, strong strictures about all sorts of behavioral customs. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm sure that when when Americans took on tiki culture, they in no way followed any of the taboos or the, yeah. you know, the rules of Polynesian culture. No, that's not what they were doing. They were just using it as a way of discarding their own rules. Mm -hmm. And I think the Romans very much used the Greeks that way. Mm -hmm. Wallace Hedrill also makes a really interesting point, and I think this can be read back into the American context too, because what I think is interesting about comparing these is not that they're exactly parallel, mm -hmm. but that by looking at what one culture is doing with another culture, you can kind of see more things about another situation. Um, he points out that the strategic use of Greek customs and language and dress, rather than sort of undermining Roman things, actually increases the symbolic power of Roman dress and Latin language and Roman actions by contrast. Mm -hmm. So by wearing the Greek pallium, for instance, suddenly the, La the Roman toga isn't just a thing you that Romans wear. It is an extreme marker of Romanness. Right. Because you put it on when you're being ultra Roman. Mm -hmm. So now the toga is a symbol of Roman pride. It's a strong Roman element. In the same way, if you use the Greek language to express relaxation and pleasure, now the Latin language is even more a marker of authority and imperial power. So it's by having this other culture that can be the marked for pleasure or marked for relaxation or whatever, or marked for exoticness, you can increase the symbolic strength of, of what is marked for Romanness. And I think you can look back at the tiki culture because on the one hand, it's an, it, it, you know, an escape from 50s America, but on the other hand, it allows 50s America to be more rigid. Right. Right? Like it, it does the other thing too of, of marking much more clearly what is American about America mm -hmm. as opposed to the exotic tropical world, right? So especially because it's so extreme, it makes the reassuring Americanness more of a symbol of America than it would be if you didn't have this contrast. Mm -hmm. You know, Greek culture is used that way repeatedly through all of Roman history as a marker of non-Romanness. And there's certainly elements of sexual mores being different in Greece than they are in Rome. That can be overstated, I think, and there's been a lot of pushback on the idea that there's sort of very rigid, upright Roman sexual mores and totally different Greek ones, and I think rightly so. I don't think it's as divided. But again, I think that Greek life allowed for relaxation of various types mm -hmm. for Romans and that they felt that they could, by being Greek, they could sort of do things they wouldn't dare to do if they were wearing a toga. But it didn't mean they didn't wear a toga too, right? Like it, it, these were, it marked off the time when they could do it safely without giving up on being Roman. Right. There's this code switching, this bilingualism mm -hmm. of culture, not just of language. Mm -hmm. So I just thought that was an, an interesting comparison, if not perfect parallel. The literature is an obvious place to look. And what it does do is it underlies and underpins, I think, a lot of Orientalism because it sets up this dichotomy between West and East, right. even if they're like 300 kilometers apart or whatever. Okay, I don't actually know how big the Mediterranean is, but <laughs> <laughs> the point is, you know, Greece isn't very far East of Italy. Right. <laughs> by global standards, but it sets up a dichotomy, an, an idea that there is a West and there's an East, and that the West can use the East as an exotic other. Right. And no matter how far that East and how far that West goes, <laughs> I think you can trace it back in lots of ways. Yes, you can trace it further back to the Greek views of the Persians, mm -hmm. um, but I don't really know, as I was saying to you earlier, I don't know how much the Persians functioned as an exotic escapism. Mm. for the Greeks. I think that they may have for some people, but I just don't know about that. But I definitely know that the Greeks were escapism for many Romans in a way that um, really becomes foundational to that idea of the exotic East. Right. That has been so harmful in so many ways and has underlain a lot of imperialist views of the world. Mm -hmm. Yay, Romans? <laughs> <laughs> So basically what I'm saying is Horace is exotica music and <laughs> um, <laughs> can't really think of the cocktail equivalent because <laughs> they both drank wine. So that doesn't count. So <laughs> pallium is the Aloha shirt. Yes, actually, the pallium is definitely the Aloha shirt. That is <laughs> definitely true. Yeah. And the Greek nude statue is the 
tiki, tiki. <laughs> statue. Well, I mean, the nude statues were often mm-hmm. religious mm-hmm. statuary. I don't think they had anywhere near the same kind of sacred function for yeah. them. But yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Apollo is the tiki god. No, wait. <laughs> I feel like I've just done a horrible act of appropriation myself by making that comparison. But yeah. So what do we do with all that then? No idea. <laughs> we continue to work with it. I mean, I really don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't have a good answer for it. Help us, people. <laughs> Tell us what we should do. I don't feel bad about, you know, Romans and Greeks, though. I think I can read Horace without feeling that he's too deeply appropriating the Greeks. I think that is the least of his crimes when it comes right down to <laughs> Like, if there are reasons to dislike Horace in terms of things he's done wrong, I think the fact that he appropriated some Greek rhythms, it's not the top of the list. Right. <laughs> I'm not worried about that. Well, it helps that it was, you know, a very long time ago. Yes, it was a very long time ago. <laughs> but yeah, you know, this comes up when we talk about cocktails and gimlets and other things too. Like, this mm-hmm. is just true. And when we talked about Turkey and, yep. you know, like it is a feature of our world. Mm-hmm. Interconnections are complicated. Mm-hmm. They are not simple. They are not easy to disentangle and they very rarely come about in an atmosphere of perfect equality and willing exchange. Yeah. Right? That's just not, I mean, I wish it were and maybe we can get there, but historically at least it has not been so. And so, you know, how much does the history of something matter? I think it matters more how much harm it is or isn't doing now. Yeah, I suppose And that's that's really the most important element Mm -hmm. and, and it's something I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, and then that's, I think that's where I feel the most at sea, if you'll excuse the metaphor, <laughs> with tiki culture right now is I don't know where it's at in terms of people now mm-hmm. being affected by it. Mm-hmm. And that comes from the, the limitation of me not knowing enough of the people who would be affected. Mm-hmm. So that's as far as I can go with it right now, I think. <laughs> Everything and anything is complicated. <laughs> And it's all connected. Well, you thought we were done with uh, talking about (laughs) depressing issues like... Never! (laughs) Racism and... (laughs) Never. We are never done. All right. Well, I don't think we can go any further with this. So shall we move to our last item? You had something. Yes. Well, it seems appropriate to thank our listeners. Mm -hmm. As always. Continuing to listen to this. (laughs) (laughs) And of course... You may well have heard the word mahalo as the Hawaiian word for thanks. Mm -hmm. So just I checked into this linguistically what's going on. It comes from uh, Proto-Polynesian masalo, which meant astonished at or admire. Hmm. And the only relevant cognate word, there's a bunch of cognate Mm -hmm. words to this in the various Polynesian languages, but the the only one that is particularly relevant to this, to one of the languages I mentioned in the video, is Maori has the word maharo, Mm -hmm. to wonder. Oh, okay. So we're wondering. (laughs) (laughs) What we should do with this. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, but thank you. Thank you for listening. Let us know what you think, because we really need some help. (laughs) Mm. And we'll be back soon. Bye. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.